I want to take a look at a really cool TypeScript thing in this video. And this is not something that I've come up with, but it's something I found online and I think you guys will like it. So I want to walk through it and see what we can both learn about TypeScript. What I want to look at is a bubble sort algorithm written only in the type system of TypeScript. Now this incredible piece of work was built by Anurag Hazra and he shared it on his Twitter a couple of months ago and he's got a link to the TypeScript playground. And so I figured why don't we walk through this and see what we can learn from it. Now, if you're not familiar with the bubble sort algorithm, I'll just say quickly that the way it works is you've got an array of numbers and you start by comparing the first two numbers. And if the first one is greater than the second one, you swap them and then you compare the next pair and do the same thing. And you repeat that over the entire array until you go all the way through and you don't have to make any swaps because the numbers are already in order. It has a worst case and average complexity of O of N squared. So there are better sort algorithms, but this is just a fun thing to do in TypeScript. So let's take a look. So we have bubble sort at the top of his TypeScript playground here. If we scroll down a bit here, we have some math utils. And this is where I think there's a lot of cool stuff to learn. First, we have this number type and it uses the built-in utility type extract where it takes some generic argument t and it will pull out the number or numbers within that and t might be a union type and then any numbers that we get in there will be what the value of t is so let's give this a try and we'll do m dot num and we can pass it a couple of things so we could pass it just string and if we do that and if we hover over num here we can see that the type is never which makes sense there's actually a cool thing that i learned also from this playground is that you can use this syntax here pointing to another type uh, the playground will actually just print that out for you so you don't have to hover over it but as you can see here there are no numbers in the type of string what if instead of string we actually hard code a string three uh, well we can see this is still a string so three is not does not have any number type but maybe we could do like one and in that case now we get the type one now that doesn't seem super useful but imagine we have a union that has multiple things in it so for example maybe two three some string value here and then also I don't know, Boolean. What extract does is pull out anything that matches our second argument here. And so we just get a union of one, two, three, and four. A basic utility to make sure that the types that we get back are only numbers. Next one we have here is really cool. And this is kind of the, the crux of how we can do number comparisons uh, within the type system. And that is this length type. Essentially, it takes any type that extends an array and it returns the length field of that array. This array is a type. It's not a literal array value and the length is also a type, but the length field of a literal array type will actually be the number type of that array length. Let me show you what I mean. M.length and let's just say string array. Now the length of string array is not going to be that interesting. It's just a number, right? It depends on what the actual value for our string array is. But if instead of string array, we actually create an array here, notice that as soon as I have a literal array type in here, now we get a number zero. And if I start putting things in here, now the type is four. This literal array type actually expects to have four values in it, a string, a number, an any, and an unknown. This is a really cool way of taking a type like an array and actually converting it essentially to a number or thinking about it the other way around, we can represent a number with an array type. Now that might not seem particularly useful, but we'll get to that in just a second. Let's move on to our next utility type here, which is push. This is pretty straightforward. As you can see, it takes a T that extends some array and then it takes a value and it just returns a new array that pushes that value onto the end of T. So that's pretty straightforward. What we could actually do to test this is use it with our length. So we can do m.push and we will pass our initial array. And then let's also pass some other value like uh, Boolean. And now what we should see is we have length five as our value for len one, right? Because now we're taking the length of our push operation here, which takes our array of four elements and pushes Boolean into them. So now we can represent a number with an array, but we can also uh, change that number by pushing new elements into it. And this is gonna be useful in the next one, n tuple. So n tuple takes two arguments. It takes a number as the first one and an optional array type as the second generic argument. And then we have a conditional statement here. So we check the length of t and if it extends n, then we just return t. So what does that mean? Well, remember, we know that if we pass a literal array as t, then we will get a number as the length. So let's say we pass an array type of two elements. So like a normal tuple, the length of t is going to be two. 
Now, when we say does two extend n, n extends number. So if we pass a literal number type here, then this is essentially an equality comparison. So we can check to see does the length equal whatever number we pass for n. And if it is, then we just return t. So what we're saying here then is, so we can say m dot n tuple if we say two, and then we pass it uh, any and any, then in this case, if we look at the value of two one, we can see it is just any and any, which makes sense, right? We found that the length of t is two, and the value of n is two, and so we just return t. If they are not the same, then we're gonna do n tuple of n, and for t, we push in the value of any. Now remember, t here is an optional generic argument, and it defaults to uh, an empty array. When we recurse, we're going to push the any value into t, and that way we are essentially incrementing the length of t by one. And then we call n tuple on n, so we use n again and we have an array of one more. So if you think about this, maybe let's say that we take out our array argument here because that's optional. Now the type shouldn't change. We should still see an array of any and any. What's happening is we get two for n and an empty array, and then we recurse. So we push it in and we say, get me an n tuple of two, but now we have as our argument an array of one element, just any, right? And so then we're gonna check again to see does the length, which is one, equal n, which is two, it doesn't. So we recurse again and we push another any in, and now the length of t will be two, n will be two, and so we return t. So basically this is the inverse of our length utility type, right? We can pass n tuple any number, for example, I could pass it 20, and we get out a type that expects an array of that many any values. So this is a great way to turn a number into some other representation. So we can go back and forth with this. Our next type is add, and it takes two generic arguments, both of which should be numbers. So we have A and we have B. And this is pretty straightforward. And this is, I think, really cool to see how we can combine these values. So we create an n tuple of A. And remember, this means we create an A type that expects exactly A number of elements. And then we create an n tuple of b, which again creates an array type that expects b number of elements. And then we spread them together within this array. So essentially we're creating a larger array that has a elements plus b elements. And then we wrap that all in a call to length. And so the type of add when you pass a and b is going to be the sum of a and b. That's pretty cool, eh? So let's see this in action. Let's create a sum here and we can say M dot add, we can pass it three and four. And if we look at the value, we can see the value is seven. This doesn't work of course with negative numbers because you can't really have an array with a negative number of elements in it, but it's pretty cool for positive numbers. And then the next type we have of course is our subtraction type and it takes two generic arguments as well. Both of these are numbers, A and B again. And this is not gonna work for negative numbers or we can't return negative numbers from our subtraction type. So that means we expect A to always be greater than B. And so that's what our condition here is going to check for. We check to see if A is greater than B. And if it's not greater than B, then we're gonna return never. So we could get never out of this type. But let's see how exactly this works. The condition here is, is a tuple of A elements, does that extend an array where we have infer some number of elements, and then after that we have B number of elements. Right? So if you think about A as the larger number, we're gonna to check to see does A represent B plus some other number of elements, right? And that other number of elements is the difference between A and B, and we're inferring that into our value here, U. Now, if that condition is true, then we know that U is the difference between A and B, so we can just return the length of U. So let's give this a try. We can type diff one, and we can say m.sub, and let's try a six and two. And if we look at the type of this, we can see the difference is four. Cool, so we can do addition and subtraction here. Let's see what our last utility type here is, and this is a comparator. Okay, so the comparator is gonna compare two numbers and return true if a particular condition is true. So let's, let's maybe look at an example first so we have an idea of what we're trying to work here. So if we look at our comparator here, and we can pass it as, let's say, five and three. The value that we get out of this is true. I'm gonna copy that, three and five, and in this case, it's false. So we can see that the comparator returns true when the first value is greater than the second value. So let's take a look now at how our comparator works here. So we take 
two numbers, n1 and n2. And if n1 extends n2, then we return false. Ah, so this is a condition that we didn't actually test here. Condition here would be where we do three and three. And in this case, when the values are the same, we also get false. That's another condition we have to think about here. So if n1 extends n2, meaning they are the same number, then we return false. Otherwise, we try our subtraction here, and we'll try and subtract n1 from n2. And this test basically says, is n2 greater than n1? Now, if n2 is greater than n1, then the value uh, of our subtype here is going to be some number. And so we're gonna have uh, an array here of one number and we'll check to see if that extends an array of never. And if n2 is greater than n1, then it will not extend never. And so we'll return false, right? If n2 is greater, we return false. If n1 is greater, meaning we can't subtract, we're gonna get never out of this we will match this conditional and so we'll return true. So if n1 is greater, we return true. If n2 is greater, we return false. And that's how we can compare two numbers together. So with all of these utility types uh, reviewed, we can now look at how our bubble sort might work. So let's scroll all the way up to the top and talk about bubble sort. So bubble sort here takes two generic arguments. First one is the array that extends some array. And then we have current, which is just kind of like a pointer for helping us keep track of how far we're going through. This doesn't actually use current as an index. It just lets us know once we have processed the entire array. And you can see that by default, we use the length of A. Now at a high level, let's talk about the recursion part of this. So you can see bubble sort calls itself, first of all, at a top level and then inside of it as well. So that's the n squared part of this algorithm, right? Bubble sort is gonna be calling to bubble sort for each subarray within it, if you will. Um, and you can see each time we do that, we have a subtraction here where we subtract one from current each time. So we subtract one from current here and here and also here. So what this means is each time we recurse, current is going to be one less than it was before. And we know we get to the end when current extends one. So when current extends one, we know we have uh, gone through the entire array. And so we can just return A at that point. Now, if current is greater than one, uh, then we check to see if A extends this array here. And essentially what we wanna do is see, can we infer a first element and a second element and then possibly other elements as well. So we're trying to see if there are two elements at the beginning of the array that we can do our comparison on. Now, if there is not even two elements in the array, then we're gonna return never. So essentially what this means is if we try and do a bubble sort of one element, we probably will get nothing back. Oh, we do get one back, which is makes sense as the right answer. Oh, do you know what's happening here? Okay, sorry. I, so what's happening here is current, of course, is gonna be one, and so current extends one, so we'll never even try and sort if there's one element in the array. But if we pass an array of no elements, that's when we get never. Okay, so we take care of the one condition. Now, this should also work for the condition where we have two elements in the array, because even though uh, we have this infer rest here, if there's nothing to catch uh, with the rest operator here, that's okay, we just won't have any value there. It'll probably be like never or something. Okay, so we're at the point where we have inferred the first and second element, and now if that's the case, then we want to bubble sort again. What we're going to do is we're gonna sort this array, and the array that we wanna sort, as you can see here, we've got this array literal, and then we're doing a spread here, and then we have a conditional statement in here. And basically this conditional statement is gonna decide, do we need to swap the first and second element or not? And how do we do that? Well, we do that with our comparator here. So we pass first and second to our number utility just to ensure that those are numbers as we would expect. And so our comparator here will return true if the first element is greater than the second element. So if we return true, then what we're gonna spread is going to be this array right here. Now, first is greater than second, we're gonna put second at the beginning, and then we're gonna do a bubble sort on the rest of the array, really, or I should say the first element in the array and the rest of the array, right? So we're essentially swapping the second and the first element. If the second element is greater than the first element, then this will be false, and we're gonna hit the second part of our conditional statement here, where we don't actually swap anything at all. We have the first, and then we have the second, and we still need to do our bubble sort on the remainder of the array, so second and the rest. And so we're gonna sort through the rest of that. Now remember, it might seem like we're putting first or second right at the beginning of the array when they might not be the lowest item overall, but that's okay because that's what this outer bubble sort is gonna do, right? It's gonna sort the entire thing again. And so essentially, uh, that's where the n squared nature of this algorithm comes in. And so this will continue to recurse until current equals one 
on the uh, remainder of this array. And then again, the outer loop will continue to recurse until current equals one um, over the whole array. So that's how we get our bubble sort. And as you can see, it works. We can, we've tried it here with just two elements, but we have a demo here where we've got a bunch of different elements and including some much higher numbers here. And so this is the bubble sort that Anurag Hazra has um, implemented. This is pretty cool. You may also want to check out some of his other work, which um, I am eager to do. I haven't had a chance to get into it yet, but he has this uh, repo called Type Trident, which is a curated list of advanced type level madness. So if you're interested in playing around with a bunch of complex TypeScript stuff, definitely check out his work. I know I'm gonna learn a lot digging through this repo and maybe you'll have some fun as well. So definitely check it out. If you enjoy TypeScript videos, feel free to like and subscribe to my channel here and thanks for watching.